Welcome to Digital Bug Bowl 2021. I'm Dr. Gwen Pearson, and I help Purdue Department of Entomology run Bug Bowl. This year, things are a little different, um, but one of the things that is always a big hit at Bug Bowl is our caterpillar pelleting. Uh, and so I wanted to make sure that we had a day where we could talk about caterpillars and how cool they are and how if you wanted to rear one, you might have one. And then just like, what is this metamorphosis thing? How does that all work? And so to do that, I am joined today by an expert from the Caterpillar Lab, Sloan Tomlinson, who is the, an educator at the Caterpillar Lab and also a parasitic wasp specialist. So we will get to see some super grody stuff. You'll love it. <laughs> so can you, Kick us off, Sloan, a little bit with by explaining what the Caterpillar Lab is and also what's happening behind your shoulder. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we're a 501c3 nonprofit located in Marlboro, New Hampshire. We're an educational outreach program. We basically go around all around New England to schools, to museums, to nature centers, etc. Uh, we give public programs where we show people all about the biodiversity of caterpillars and all about their life cycles and their interactions with other animals. Uh, we rear dozens and dozens of species of caterpillars right here in the lab and rear them from eggs to adults. And uh, basically that's what we do. We just are educators and we just try to get people really interested in how amazing these creatures are and this wonderful biodiversity happening all around us at all times. Um, and this is actually a perfect example of biodiversity <laughs> happening around us at all times. So believe it or not, this little thing you see here, and I'll show you in a minute how tiny this thing is, this is actually a caterpillar. And this is actually what's called a leaf miner. And leaf miner caterpillars live literally inside of a leaf. So this caterpillar is not on top of the leaf, it's actually physically inside the leaf. So it's going through and it's eating all the little cells one at a time. And you can actually see the little leaf cells there. And you can see its jaws, you can actually see the food passing through its body. And then you see the six legs that all caterpillars have, the six chew legs. And you can even see little indentations of the pro legs, which we'll show you better on a, on a little bit bigger caterpillar. But these little caterpillars live their life inside these leaves, feeding on the internal part of the leaf, 
Eventually they'll break through, they'll spin a cocoon, they'll pupate outside the leaf, and then they'll fly off and be moths and start the process over again. And one of the reasons we love showing these caterpillars is because these are literally happening right around us at all times. So there's leaves all over the place full of different kinds of leaf miners and different kinds of caterpillars hidden. Uh, caterpillar biodiversity is huge. There's an estimated 300,000 species of butterflies and moths in the world, uh, which is enormous. We don't even know about a lot of them. Uh, and even here in New England, we have probably about 3,000 species of moths and butterflies. Uh, which is pretty impressive for a cold climate like this, uh, especially considering right now it's April and we actually are having a blizzard. Uh, so yay, New England. Um, but these caterpillars are even out there right now. Uh, this was just found yesterday morning out in the, by an airport, just feeding on sedge. Uh, so anytime you find leaves that just have that little sort of brown spot or even like a little shape of a spirally thing on them, you look carefully underneath the microscope and you very well could find a caterpillar. There's also flies and beetles and soft flies that have the same kind of feeding process as larvae, uh, but these caterpillars are pretty great. Uh, and I'll just show you how incredibly tiny that is. I don't even know if you can see that, but wow. this little strip of grass or sedge rather wow. is where that caterpillar is. And so the caterpillar is just a tiny little speck inside of there. Um, and so caterpillars are amazing because they do come in just such a wide variety of shapes and sizes, um, you know, from the tiniest little things to things literally bigger than hot dogs, uh, <laughs> which we actually mirror here uh, called hickory horn tussock. Yes. I mean, hickory horn devils, uh, which are giant caterpillars, largest caterpillar in North America, one of the largest in the entire world. Um, and it's that biodiversity that we always like to push here at the lab because there's just this, so many different varieties and so much different life stories and so many different sort of interactions with other species. Um, and then one of the main things that we'll talk about is metamorphosis. So what is metamorphosis? What is a caterpillar exactly? So a caterpillar belongs to the order Lepidoptera and like several other large, very species rich and diverse orders, in fact, the most species rich orders of insects in the world have complete metamorphosis. And that means that they go from an egg to a larva, to a pupa, to an adult. And the larva is what grows. So the larva actually changes size as it's molting, it sheds its skin. All insects being arthropods have to shed their skin in order to get bigger. And Caterpillars are just the name that we give to the larva of butterflies and moths. Um, all of them start off as eggs. And I wanted to show you these because these are really, really pretty eggs. <laughs> so these. <laughs> are the eggs oh. of buck moths. So you can actually see them starting to develop. So you can see the ones that are kind of more yellow. Those are still starting to develop. You can see these sort of clear spots happening. So these eggs actually spent all winter outside. So their mother laid the eggs on the stem uh, in fall, and then she died. And then her eggs basically just sat out there in the cold, blustery New England winter. <laughs> and they'll all emerge soon, and they'll start feeding. And so these are actually developing eggs. Uh, which I think they're one of the prettiest eggs because they actually wrap all the way around the stem. And so that's how the mother lays her eggs, which is really quite cool. Um, some other caterpillars go even more, I mean, some other moths go even more in depth as to how they lay eggs. This is a gross one. So I wanted to show this one because gross things are always kind of cool. This <laughs> weird looking thing is a female bagworm. So these are the kinds of caterpillars that make little bags like this. So these will be hanging from trees. You'll often find them on evergreens. This is we have evergreen. a lot of these in Indiana. <laughs> uh, they definitely can be a little bit destructive in large numbers, but they are a native species. Mm -hmm. The males leave these after they've pupated as adults and they fly off and find a female. The female never leaves her bag. So the caterpillar creates this bag by spinning silk and wrapping little pieces of its food around itself and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and then pupates inside of it. Uh, but the female never leaves. The female is what's called larva form. And so the female has no eyes, she has no legs, she has no wings. She's literally just this big, huge sack of eggs. And so these are what's inside the, the bags all winter long. And she's literally mummified. 
And so if I crack her open gently, you can see that she's full of eggs. So there's all these eggs and it's just like a hollow shell. Wow. And so in the wild, what would happen is those would, the babies would literally just hatch out of her body and crawl off and find, and find new food sources and start their little tiny bags. And they're really adorable when they're babies. We see them as pests sometimes, but as babies, when they first start their little bag, they look like little wizard hats. So they're <laughs> actually super adorable as babies. Um, obviously, as soon as they hatch, caterpillars start eating. So larval insects, they basically are the ones that feed. So they feed and they feed and they feed and they poop and they feed and they feed and they poop and they feed and they poop until they pupate. And that's pretty much their entire job. So caterpillars start growing fairly quickly. Um, and I'm going to show you a species which is actually really great to show because we get to see a lot of the sort of internal structures of them, which is really, really neat. So these are called soybean loopers. And these are actually a pest. You'll find them in, inside of greenhouses frequently. Oh, wow. um, and they are these little green things. They don't live outside that much in the wild around here, but they'll definitely find them in greenhouses. Down south, they'll be in crops. They can be pests. They're not a native species, but they're really great for showing the internal structures of things. Uh, that one's not as interesting. So let's find this other one in here. Let's see. That's oh yeah, that's better. So what's really cool about these caterpillars is you get to see one something you don't get to see a lot of other caterpillars. If you see this pulsing thing that's happening all the way along its back, that's its heart. So it's its dorsal aorta, its heart muscles back here. And insects don't have veins or circulatory systems like we do. It's an open circulatory system. So it's literally just sloshing their version of blood back and forth, back and forth uh, over this hollow sort of part of its body where all of its organs and its muscles are and its nervous system. And that, blood, that heart is just sort of pumping all the time. And this is true for all insects. All insects have this dorsal aorta and an open circulatory system with just the blood squishing around. <laughs> um, what's also neat about these is that a lot of them, whoop, you're not happy. <laughs> uh, let's check this one out. Um, <laughs> You get to see its tracheal tubes. Well, first off, I'm going to show you what's really cool about. So see these little spots right? <laughs> these spots right here. Oh, you're good. Never work with animals. <laughs> these little spots right here, not the black spots, but these little tiny yellow spots. Those are what's called spiracles. And spiracles are little holes that basically enter into the body through these little tracheal tubes. This is how the insect gets oxygen into its body, which is really super neat. Uh, they don't have lungs like we do. Oxygen is basically passively put into their body and their blood can't carry oxygen. So these have these, the, all the spiracles are connected to tracheal tubes, which are these long thin tubes that run throughout its entire body and they're all interconnected. And if you look closely, and let's see if I can get it to see. I'm going to want to get a little bit better. These ones are a little hard to see because they're starting to get a little bit older, but if we look really carefully around these spiracles, you can see this kind of little things jutting off into the body. And those are its tracheal tubes. And those actually run throughout. Oh, that's a good one. You can see that they're on the end. So you can see this sort of network of little tubes coming out. And those run through its entire body system and they're all interconnected and that's how the oxygen gets into the insect, which is really, really cool. Um, this also is a good place to show you how a caterpillar sees. So caterpillars have very poor vision and that's simply because they don't really need to see things. All they're doing is eating and pooping and eating and pooping and they just remain on their host plant the entire time that they're doing it they don't actually need to be flying around or running around or going and doing things that require a lot of vision. So they have very, very simple vision. And the vision is based on, <laughs> there are six, what are called stomata. So you see right there, those little white specks there, those are its eyes. And basically those eyes simply are just seeing light and dark, light and dark. That's pretty much all they're seeing. 
Um, and so as a caterpillar grows and sheds its skin, eventually it has to pupate. And so caterpillars transform into a pupa. A lot of times we hear people say, oh, well, isn't a pupa just a hollow pod with like all the goo inside of it? <laughs> but in reality, the pupa is basically sort of a not quite finished adult. Uh, and it forms that entire system underneath its body, which is pretty cool. Uh, and it sheds to become a pupa. So these are pupa of those same caterpillars I just showed you. And they're very green and very sort of clearish looking. But I'll show you in a much browner pupa, but you can actually just make out there's a long line of an antenna. There's legs tucked up there. There's the eye, there's the wing, and then the abdomen. So the body is already formed. It's just all the organs inside of it are just kind of reformulating themselves to be able to be used for the different parts of the body of the caterpillar, I mean, of the, of the adult moth. Uh, and actually we have, <laughs> just to show you how it transforms, eventually that pupa will become this kind of pretty, but sort of bland little moth. So this is an adult soybean looper. So you can actually see that whole process there from start to finish, which is really, I think, pretty amazing. Um, so in the caterpillar stage, caterpillars have to deal with a lot of predation. So that's their main stage of life. For a lot of moths and butterflies, their longest period of life is spent as a larva, as a caterpillar. And so they're externally feeding on plants. Uh, they need to protect themselves. So there's all kinds of different ways that they do that. Um, I'm actually going to show you a really neat way. Uh, one of the main things that drives caterpillar evolution as far as how, they're, how they look is birds, because birds are highly visual predators and birds rely very heavily on caterpillars for food. Um, and so birds have this kind of instinctual sort of memory of what a caterpillar is. They're like, I know what a caterpillar is. It's shaped like this, it moves like this, that's food. So one way to prevent yourself from having to do that is to make yourself not look like a caterpillar at all. Um, so let's see if I can get this all in there. <laughs> this is a curved lined outlet. And as you can see, that doesn't look much like a caterpillar. And certainly if you're a bird hunting around on leaves and you see this weird shaped thing, you're like, what is that? That's not food. And you move on. Um, let's see, I can show you a little bit. There we go. There's its head. <laughs> and you can actually see it's, there's its true legs there. So caterpillars have six true legs, just like all insects do. And it will retain those legs as it grows up into an adult. But one of the other things caterpillars have are pro legs. So the caterpillar's thorax ends at its last segment that has the two legs. The rest of it is actually its abdomen. And on its abdomen, caterpillars will have what are called pro legs. So these right here are pro legs. They're basically little squishy little tubes that end in little things called crotchets with these little hooks. And so you can see whoop, these little hooks there grabbing on. <laughs> to the leaf. And you can see how he's moving right now. That's what these caterpillars move like. So they move like this really weird little dance that they do, which is really, really neat. Yeah, and that's how he moves. So he'll slowly move around a leaf just like that, swaying back and forth. Again, making it so he doesn't look like a caterpillar to, to a bird. Um, so I want to just show you another pupa which I think, Gwen, you actually have some of these, too. We do. Let's see, let's see who's wiggles more. <laughs> I got some pretty so, good wiggling here. Yeah, there we go. There we oh, go. no, your, yours are more wiggly. OK, yeah. he wins the wiggle off. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the pupa of tobacco hornworms, which if you grow any kind of nightshade crops in your garden, like tomatoes or peppers or eggplants or potatoes, you might end up getting those big green caterpillars that you don't particularly care for. Well, those caterpillars are these. They turn into these pupa. And these are great examples to show that a pupa whoop, is a very moving one. Pupa is a living thing. So it's not like a pod. It's not like a home or a shelter that the caterpillars made. It's the caterpillar actually becomes the pupa. So that's one of the things that we always get a lot of here at the lab is people will be like, well, 
does it make a pupa? No, it doesn't make a pupa. It becomes a pupa. It literally becomes a pupa. And these are great ones to show the actual outer structure of the pupa. Whoop. <laughs> that was very active. Still so wiggly. Here. <laughs> here you can definitely see the eye. So that's the eye right there. And, and then you can see this is its antenna. So that's its long antenna. And then you can see it's six legs. So one, two, three, and then one, two, three. And then you can also see its wings and you can see its spiracles. So those are still the air pockets, basically. Those are the holes going into the tracheal tubes. So it still has and retains all that same sort of stuff. It's basically just got new parts. And what's happening inside the pupil shell is that all those parts are basically finalizing themselves. Um, this is pretty neat because these are feeding moths. So these moths have very long proboscis that they feed with. And this one is really moving. <laughs> They're very active. Though. So this long thing here, that's actually not just the length of it. The tongue, the proboscis actually goes all the way around there, wraps back around there and then goes around there. So that's actually how the tongue is forming um, because you can see here, that is the tongue of this moth when it's an adult. It's actually longer than the moth is. And these are actually really important pollinators. Um, cocoons are also something that we also get questions about because cocoons, what is a cocoon? Well, a cocoon is a, actually just a silken covering that some larval insects make around themselves before they pupate. Moths most famously make the cocoons. Uh, we think of silk moths that we get silk clothing from. Those are cocoons of the silk moths. Uh, here in North America, we have what are called giant silk moths, which are actually not related to the silk moths, but things like Cecropia and Polyphemus and Luna, these big, huge moths, people that are very, you know, think are popular. They're also very pretty. They're well known. Um, and so I'm going to show you, so this right here, this is a cocoon of a Polyphemus moth. Mm. And I actually just cut it open this morning, very gently. Uh, you can definitely do that with cocoons as long as you know what you're doing. You're careful. <laughs> uh, because the pupa is safe inside of it. This is the pupa. I'll show it underneath the microscope too. So this is the pupa of a Polyphemus moth. And you can see those are its antenna, which they have very feathery antenna. And then its legs, its wings, its spiracles. So all pupa have this. They have all those same kind of parts. But what's really cool about these is how intense their cocoons are. So I don't know if you can see that, how shiny that is. So this is actually the cocoon. If I try to pull it apart, I literally can't. It's like hard plastic. And this is because they have these cocoons, they fall into leaf litter, and they spend all winter in these cocoons. And it has to be waterproof, it has to be completely safe, and it has to protect them somewhat from being squished. Uh, and what's amazing is these moths actually have a special enzyme that comes out of their head when they want to leave the pupa. And that's because moths don't have mandibles. They can't chew. So in order to get out of this hard, hard cocoon, they basically have an enzyme called cuconase. It comes out of their head, it melts the silk, and then they can push their way through, uh, which is pretty bizarre. It's really neat to see it happen. Like you, we sometimes get to see what's happening with the larger moths. You'll see this sort of clear liquid coming out of their head, it's pumping as they're moving out of the cocoon, which is really, really neat. Uh, we actually just had a cocoon happen this morning, which I'm gonna show. These are probably one of the most well-known moth caterpillars. This is a woolly bear cocoon. So woolly bears spent all winter as caterpillars and then they emerged in spring and when the first weather started warming up and eating as much as they possibly could of the new growth, and then they spin their cocoons and then they'll emerge as adults later in summer, lay their eggs, start the process over again. Uh, and the caterpillars again will overwinter. This is actually also a great example to show what some hairy caterpillars do. So some hairy caterpillars sew in their hairs. They take their hairs off as they're spinning their cocoon and they spin in their cocoon with their hairs in it. And the reason why they do that is because hairs on cat hairy caterpillars are very hard for predators to digest. So a lot of times hairy caterpillars are not caterpillars that birds or other animals would go after because the hairs are hard to digest or the hairs can cause some irritation. So that's actually a good point to bring up sort of a one rule of thumb with caterpillars. If you find a caterpillar in the wild and it's really hairy or it's really spiny, 
it's best not to pick it up unless you know for sure what it is. We always say, you know, with wildlife, you want to try to leave it alone as much as possible anyways. But certainly caterpillars are great to hold and pick up. And as long as you're gentle, you can do it, but you should definitely exercise some caution with the hairy and spiny ones because they can cause skin irritation. They're not going to kill you or anything like that, but there's certainly something you don't necessarily want to get on your skin, especially like on your neck or your inner arm or something like that, because that's definitely where it will be unpleasant. <laughs> um, but so why do caterpillars have all these weird defenses and adaptations? Well, the reason why is because caterpillars are basically the main herbivores that's that transfer energy from plants to other animals. They transfer more energy from plants to other animals than any other animal on the planet. And that's because caterpillars are so diverse, they're so everywhere, they're all, mostly anyways, herbivorous. So they're all eating these plants, they're eating lots of it. Their bodies are basically just big sacks of food for other animals. Uh, in fact, birds rely heavily on feeding their young caterpillars. In fact, even the birds that you might think are not insect eaters, like little finches and stuff like that, their babies need protein. And a lot of species of birds feed their, their young only caterpillars. Uh, and I would say that I think that's about 97% of bird species have to feed their young insects. And a lot of them include caterpillars because one, they're easy to adjust. There's not a lot of hard parts to them. Uh, they're just chock full of protein, chock full of minerals. They're basically a perfect food for a lot of different animals. Uh, which brings me into one of my favorite topics, which are parasitoids. So I work with parasitoid wasps here. And there are a whole host of parasitoid wasps and parasitoid flies that use caterpillars as their hosts. And what a parasitoid is, is an insect whose larvae, so again, complete metamorphosis, these insects have an egg, a larva, a pupa, and an adult. Their larvae feed on other insects, and oftentimes internally, sometimes externally, and they always kill their host. So they always kill their host, which is sometimes hard to see, but they're actually super important to the environment because all these parasitoids and predators that rely solely on caterpillars help control the populations of the caterpillars. If they were the caterpillars had nothing taken care of them, because these moths are laying hundreds of eggs at times, you would end up having so many caterpillars, they decimate the food source, there wouldn't be any food left, and then the caterpillars themselves would die out. So these parasitoids are kind of like checks and balances. They kind of keep control of things. Uh, so a lot of people who raise caterpillars maybe don't like them, but here at the lab, we celebrate them because they are important parts of the caterpillar story. So for those of you that are squeamish, maybe you don't want to see this, but <laughs> this Ooh. is a caterpillar that has come to a bad end. Come to a bad end, yes. <laughs> this caterpillar. This caterpillar actually, these little squishy things, and you can see one of them moving right there. Actually, let me get closer. So this one's actually moving. Uh, these are eulophid wasp larvae. So these wasp larvae actually feed externally on the caterpillar. They start off as what looks like little pimples almost, and they, they're gregarious, they grow together, and they eventually consume the internal parts of the caterpillar. The caterpillar is now dead. And they're actually spinning cocoons. So we think of moths spinning cocoons, wasps, bees, ants, lots of other insects that have larval stages also spin cocoons. So this weird silky stuff, that's not from the caterpillar. That's actually from the little gross little blob larvae there that are <laughs> now spinning their cocoons. And so these will spin loose little cocoons and they'll eventually make these weird little hard pupa inside those cocoons and they'll emerge as adults and they'll start the process over again and find another caterpillar to lay their eggs on. Um, and so parasitoids and caterpillars and insects that use caterpillars as their only food source are so interlinked that that's one of the reasons we celebrate it because biodiversity needs that kind of interaction. It needs that kind of interconnectedness between all these different species working together. Some of them eat plants, some of them eat the ones that eat plants. And there's even ones that eat the ones that eat the ones. So there's things called hyperparasitoids. So there's wasps that lay their eggs inside of the pupa of wasps who ate caterpillars. So it's this constant little, like, you know, multi-layered cake, basically. <laughs> um, I wanted to show you this. This is something that's a little bit, this is definitely just not a parasitoid, but I wanted to show you what a wasp pupa looks like. This is a wasp pupa, and I'm showing it to you because this is a potter wasp. And as a larva, 
This wasp only ate caterpillars. So these belong to a subfamily of wasps where they're solitary, they build nests out of mud, and all the females collect for their young are caterpillars, and that's all they feed on. So this pupa, when it was a larva, consumed a bunch of caterpillars inside of its nest and has now become a pupa. And you can see how different the wasp pupa is and the moth pupa because you yeah. have all the parts are separated, but it's basically like a miniature yellow version of the adult. Um, and so I think we're running close on time. So I'll open up for questions. Sure, have we gotten any questions? Okay, so in that case, you should just show us the coolest thing you've got. The coolest thing I've got. Uh, <laughs> hmm. <laughs> well, you got, I should have shown the Yulofid wasp later. Uh, what else? What's the coolest thing I've got? Um, I would say this is a pretty cool thing. This is a Cecropia cocoon that we Whoa. just collected. <laughs> These are the largest moths in North America. So they're actually the largest flying insect in North America. Um, these are giant moths. They live all over the eastern part of the United States. Uh, and they create these very large cocoons, which again, are going to be outside all winter long. And what's neat about them, I always think, is that they're actually multi-layered. So I don't know if you can see that. This what? is actually two cocoons. So the outer layer is, again, that hard, like, unterrible, plastic-like, waterproof. It's brown because they're using digestive enzymes as they're spinning their silk, and they sort of spit up on it <laughs> in order to make it brown. That way it camouflages it, but it also helps waterproof it. But then inside, because who wants to sleep all winter in this hard plastic thing, they create this nice snug sort of down comforter. You can see it's all furry and fuzzy. And that's inside of that would be where their pupa is. So their pupa is inside these two layered cocoons, wow. nice deep and warm all winter long. Um, so uh, can you t tell us a little bit about, so caterpillars make silk, mm -hmm. spiders make silk. How are they different? Uh, spider silk is, they're basically, basically the same kind of protein. So that's a similar protein that they're both using. Um, Spider silk is more versatile in the sense that spiders create different kinds of silk. So there's spider silk that they make for their webs, spider silk they make for wrapping something up, spider silk they make for drag line. So they're actually able to control the different kinds of silk that they make. For caterpillars, it's mostly used for cocooning, but not all of them. So some of them will use silk just for suspending themselves. This is actually a great example of that. This is a swallowtail pupa. So swallowtails, can you see that? Yep. So swallowtails are butterflies and butterflies, we use the, the fancy term chrysalis. Chrysalis is just a term for a butterfly pupa, but you can see how it's sort of dangling like that. And that's because it has what we, we like to call a seatbelt. So it's basically the caterpillar creates a little seatbelt around itself, attaching itself to the twig and kind of hangs back and then it pupates like that. So that's all the silk that that caterpillar was ever going to use versus, you know, a cecropia using all of that silk to make the cocoon. Uh, caterpillar silk is much thicker than spider silk. Uh, it's actually much stronger even, uh, which is why silk, as in silk moss silk, uh, was used for parachutes for a long time. Uh, I don't think it is anymore, but it was for a very long time used for parachutes because of how strong it is. It's stronger than steel. Uh, so it's pretty amazing, wonderful stuff. I was kind of thinking also the place where the silk comes from is pretty different between spiders yes. and caterpillars. So yeah. the spider, it's on the behind, and yep. the caterpillar, and it's at the front. Correct, yes. So where in the front does it let come? Me, let me show you the loopers again, because I can probably see the spinnerets on the loopers. Okay. So there we go. <laughs> uh, so this, what where the silk comes from on a caterpillar is from right underneath its head. It's a thing called, a, it's, a, it's a spinneret, just like it is on a, on a um, spider, but it's a little gland. And if I gently turn them over, you might be able to see it. Whoop. I don't want to behave here. Let's see if we try to do it that way. Yeah, there we go. So, whoop. Yep. <laughs> There's its head. And then if he lifts his head again, I will show you. Yep. So you see that little point right there in the middle? Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, it's got a little point right there. That's its spinneret. 
So it's a little centrally located thing right at the bottom of its head, and that's where it produces silk from. And the, spi and the spider silk glands are sort of coiled up inside of its abdomen. For caterpillars, uh, the silk gland is actually a long dual thing. So it goes along both sides of its body. It splits from the middle and then goes all the way along its abdomen. Uh, and it uses the proteins that it gets from food to create its silk. So these caterpillars do also create a cocoon. It's a very loose cocoon, certainly not as fancy as the, <laughs> as the cecropias, but there you go. That's a good angle of it. Yeah. It's a sharp bit right there in the middle. That's still well, we did get one question, which was, do you have hornworms at Purdue? Yeah, <laughs> we do have them. I have one right here. Um, once they get to a certain age, their little horns start to get smaller. Um, but yeah, we keep these most of the time. So we do have an insect zoo um, here at Purdue in the Department of Entomology. And we usually have these guys because they're so soft. I just love how soft they are. Um, yeah. And they're also nice and big and squeegee. Yeah, they're great, so, they're great learning tools for sure, too. So it's, we, we are almost at the end here. So what else should we know about caterpillars before we go, or parasites? <laughs> um, I would say that, what, that they're, all, they're all vital and important creatures in the environment, for sure. So that's one of the things that makes you know, all of these insects important. You know, we're dealing with a lot of insect decline in the world right now due to a wide variety of things. Uh, <clears throat> but insects make up so much of life on Earth. Uh, you know, their biomass is, is much greater than the biomass of all the mammals in the world. And they're so important to all the different food webs that they belong to that we really do need to care about them, no matter whether they're ugly or not, or gross or not ones that we particularly care for, they're all important parts of the ecosystem for sure. So even the caterpillars we don't like eating our crops, like the hornworms are important parts of the ecosystem because other animals use them as food. Uh, they're pollinators as adults. Uh, that's true for a lot of, of the parasitoids too. So we find the parasitoids kind of gross and icky because they're eating caterpillars and eating their insides and killing them. But the adults feed on nectar and feed on sap. And so a lot of the adult parasitoid wasps and flies are actually important pollinators themselves. So everyone has a part to play. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. If you're looking for something fun to read, um, there's a brand new book out by Rosemary Mosco. Butterflies are pretty gross, uh, and it's absolutely delightful, and I think your kids will love it. Um, and if you have any questions, please do post them in our live chat on uh, Facebook or YouTube, or you can message us. And if you have any specific questions, I'm sure we can reach out to Sloan, and he can help us answer them later. So bye, everybody.